what we'll talk today is uh, just about some of the tools that uh, really we have built into LiveView that make uh, that make you know embedded development a lot easier. Um, that kind of come just just basically built into using when you decide to use nerves for your embedded project uh, or, or even things that are bigger um, that just make building real time control a lot, a lot easier. Um, I actually have a that link down at the bottom um, if you want to look at the code base that I'm walking through. That's available there. Um, well, let me copy. Won't let me copy that. I'm putting the chat. Um, but anyway. Uh, so I've been instructing myself. Uh, so I've actually um, had a, a real privilege of working with Elixir in my day job pretty much nonstop for seven years now. Um, the last two years, uh, I've been uh, CTO at Alloy. Uh, we're a recreational boat company. I'll talk a little about that, but it's actually our first time working with nerves in production. And so really getting to spend 100% of the time working in, in nerves. Um, and so a couple of things we'll talk about today are just Slight little slice of that, of uh, uh, what I've been able to learn there. Um, so yeah, Alloy, we're uh, we're building a uh, a recreational boat with software at the center. Um, just you know, the software really gives a chance to do some out some some uh, autonomy um, and really just all around better UX of compared to what's existing in the boat market. Which is if you think cars are are backwards in um, how the technology is advanced. Cars in the last 20 years, what it's taken to get cars to be advanced the last 20 years, boats are 20 years behind that. Um, so just building a boat that has software at the center um, gives a little capability to do that and just give you an idea of kind of what, what we've been working on. And hopefully the video comes across. This is actually our test boat. Um, and I'll preface it by saying everything here is Elixir uh, minus a little bit of rust to deal with some lower level stuff. Um, so the boat is actually able to drive its own steering wheel, run its own, acceler uh, its own throttle on the engine. Um, there's an iPad that runs a Phoenix app, um, and it's able to navigate around the lake autonomously. So you kind of like go over here, it drives there, avoids boats, um, all along the way. Um, and actually has a pretty nice, pretty nice interface to work with, um, while it's doing that. Um, so like I said, everything is, uh, we decided early on, um, one of the big benefits we wanted that we get out of using Elixir is obviously the robustness, but also the ability to run everything on one single stack. So within our within our cluster, we have a cluster of nerves devices. They each run, each of them connects to different parts of the boat. So one of them talks to a stepper motor that drives the throttle. One of them talks to a PWM to a servo that drives the steering wheel. Um, another one receives uh, from a uh, a uh, set of um, a library. That actually, Aaron Aaron is on the call is also on our team. Um, he wrote a library to talk to a, a Furuno radar ingest that and then sends data over to our system. Um, and those all get to talk along that, that networking, uh, the cluster. So, oh, and some talk can as well. There's a lot of can on the boat. So all these different protocols are low level protocols that we actually get to take advantage of in one layer. Um, and in fact, just to give you kind of an idea of, uh, and then at the end of the day, we can also put Phoenix on there and Phoenix provides some really beautiful interfaces. This is all, all of this is Phoenix live view. So we're sending all the data from the boat. We're, we're rendering it on Mapbox, all the 3D rendering, um, all that's happening from data being driven uh, from, uh, from Phoenix. Um, <clears throat> so you really have noticed and, and what I've, I found to be unique uh, and why I've enjoyed working with Linux for a while and, and this project especially um, is the NERS really allows us to do a full stack, really truly full stack development. So with one language, with one, you know, mostly one language, obviously a little JavaScript in there, there's a little rust here and there. Um, but really, really, you know, across across the different parts of the product, one language. Um, there's one concurrency model. So the OTP gen server model that you're thinking about when you're dealing with interrupts from a low-level system is the same exact uh, mental, mental model you put in when you're dealing with a button press from the user in the interface. Um, one network fabric, maybe better, you know, one kind of kind of uh, communication channel uh, through messaging um, and one code base. And, and for us, and again, nerves for us really is not only does it give us access to some of those lower level stuff, but really it's also a distribution model that everything all, across all systems of the boat are actually deployed the same way. We build a, firm, a single firmware image, we, we flash it. Um, Aaron and I worked with uh, 15 years ago working on autonomous vehicles for the DARPA Grand Challenge. And uh, the time it took us to make a change, get it deployed. We were at the time running in Java, which was a, you know, which was a, unheard of at the time. It was us and one other team were actually using Java. Um, 
that was pretty fast to, to jar it up, copy it over and run it. Um, but now we can be on the boat and in a couple of minutes, we can make a change, flash it, see the effect and get the, get everything back out and do it again and again and again. Um, and that's not messing with four different types of deployment methodologies across different layers of the boat. Um, and really out of that, we get, we get a low level hardware interfaces, um, everything from low level hardware interfaces for, like I said, we, we're dealing with interrupts, we're dealing with can, um, we also get single records of truth for things. So we have a singleton process that runs in the cluster that represents the vessel state. Where's the vessel in the world? What is its pitch y'all role? Those kind of things. Um, we get robust message passing. Um, and we get stuff, soft real-time scheduling, which is important for kind of stuff we'll talk about in a little bit. I can run my control loop for speed control next to the web server and not be concerned that I'm going to stall out the speed control loop. Um, there are things like that that just come out of the box uh, with that great debugging tools and obviously a, a full featured UI. So really this is kind of, you know, again, prefacing what we're about to talk about, but you know, this is really our, you know, the real superpower of, of Elixir, Nerves, OTP um, is being able to have all this capability um, in one system with one language, one skill set. So when you're building a team, when you're building up a product, you're not dealing with five different silos that have to talk to each other. Everything can happen in one. Right. Um, we run down to rust. Uh, so a lot, we do, we do use a fair amount of rust for things. We process up LIDAR images. Elixir takes a little time doing cosines and signs, so we let Rust do that. But even that is wrapped in a port. And so we've got that same kind of, we're able to extend some of that capability. Um, so that's a little bit about Alloy um, and hopefully transition to kind of what we want to talk about today, uh, which is um, uh, using those kind of little bits of those tools to build out control systems a lot easier. Um, okay. Kind of see, the, see it here, and I'll try to hold it in a way that will like to see that. So if you've ever done taken a control systems course or a, uh, a mechanical engineering or anything like that that talks about signal systems, there's a common uh, 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 something's walking on me. There's a common uh, uh, experiment that you do called ball beam experiment. And basically you've got a, a beam, uh, not, not our beam, but different but actual physical beam. And along that beam, you've got a ball that's able to roll, and you're able to control, usually control the pitch with or the uh, the tilt of the beam with the servo arm, and some way to know where the ball is. And the control systems really say, you know, try to try to get a way to say, um, uh, here is you know, here's where the ball is. Uh, I want to put the ball here and have the system actually maintain the ball's location along that um, along the uh, uh, the track. Will that say? That might say. So, by the way, can everybody see that? Okay, alongside the the share screen, or is that not visible? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, cool. Um, so this this setup specifically, we've got um, a servo over here, uh, which is uh, actually a robotis. It's actually a smart servo. We'll talk about uh, kind of some things we do with that later. But it's got a um, a one wire interface, so a half duplex interface. So there's a little board in the middle here that just does that translation. But you could do the same thing with the um, with a, a regular PWM servo. And the other end, we've got a um, a little uh, uh, discrete time of flight uh, sensor that's able to tell how far away the ball is. Actually, it's, it's way over over spec because it actually has three by three grid and tells you all sorts of different things about it. But for now, we're just using the center piece to tell us how far away the the uh, uh, the ball is and let me pull in let's make a quick note while you're pulling that up uh, for anyone who might have a hard time seeing you can click the single speaker button on that window and then you can stretch the window the camera window so you can get a, a better view of that um and we've got a little web applications running on that and then let me show you so i'll pull up the code real quick we can talk through a little bit here um actually i'll do this that. And let's pull you up here and do that. Okay. So uh, we've got the sensor. It's sitting to a distance sensor uh, gen server, which is uh, oops, wrong window. So the distance sensor and all that's doing is listening for um, it creates this, this uh, TMF8820, which is the, the sensor. Uh, the the uh, distance sensor listens to that, 
every time that gets a reading, it sends a message to this server with a result in it. And we do a few things because we're getting all that message. We're sending one single number out. Um, and we're able to set on the ball, this ball server, we're able to say, hey, this is where the ball is along the, along the path. Um, we go to the ball. Uh, this is another gen server. That's basically all it does is really keep track of one thing, which is the distance of the ball. Uh, so where the ball is along the path. Um, but it also provides a, uh, a subscription where you can uh, subscribe and something else along there with PubSub can get access to that, where that ball is along the track. And that puts out the ball position. And then we've got a, uh, the beam and the beam again is similar. It just represents where that beam angle is. So how, what angle the beam is located at, um, it's currently tilted. And same idea, it gets a, um, uh, it's got a command. You can command it to be at a certain angle. So it's responsible to really say, okay, I want the beam at two degrees. That means it's going to figure out, well, that means you put the servo at this um, and then keep track of that. It again has a, has a pub soap we can listen to. Um, and then finally that talks out to the servo uh, and that servo is uh, here. Um, and that uses Robotis is the, is the company that makes the servo. I've got a library that, um, uh, Hopefully, hopefully publish it in, in a week or so. Uh, you can write to. Basically, it just says when it connects, connect to the um, uh, the Robotis servo and start to send it where it wants it to be. So that's that loop of from the or for the two pathways of data. So from the sensor into the system to know where the ball position is, and from that taking that bean angle and eventually actuating uh, that sensor. Um, and real quick to give you an idea of what that looks like. If I come back here, um, we've got manual control of it. So I can take this. And if you watch the camera's tilt center, I'm going to watch that. Uh, I'm able to control the tilt of the beam. And then this is just me kind of controlling it in an open loop fashion. I can move the ball back and forth. And then I can see on the screen that same representation of where the ball is along that, along that beam. Um, and since we have the, since we're using PubSub and we're publishing where the ball is and we're publishing to anyone who wants to know what the angle of the beam is, I can actually show that inside live view. And uh, here I've got, I'm going to subscribe into the ball. This is the live view for that, that main view. Subscribing to the ball, uh, the beam, and then later we'll show the controller. And I'm just using that to literally just rotate the S inside the SVG. So that display is just an SVG. We're taking those two bits of data, the, the beam angle here and the ball distance and using that to display, uh, to make this, to make this, uh, this show what the, what the system's actually doing. So that's the, that's the kind of the setup. Um, but it's an open loop system. So, um, oh, and I'm sorry, I forgot to say one more thing. The other thing we have, uh, which is fine. We can see where the ball is, but um, if you noticed in when we're actually getting say where the, where the ball is, we're also, uh, using telemetry to, to send out a telemetry message to the system as well. So I'm actually creating a telemetry ball beam ball distance. And if I go to the telemetry file that comes with Phoenix, I can actually tell it, Hey, by the way, show me the ball beam distance, show me the ball beam command. And so not only do I have this here, I can actually go, uh, let's open that new window and move you there. I need this one there. Now I can go to metrics and I can actually see here a graph of that ball, that ball distance over time. So all of that is coming through um, just a few lines of code. I've now got a live, a live graph shown to me of pretty much any parameter I want. We'll use that a bit later. Um, so those are the tools that I have available to me. Uh, I've got a way to control it. I've got a really easy way to, to visualize whatever piece of data I want. And so now uh, we can talk through the, the actual control. So this is open loop control. I'm, I'm, I'm actually in the system. It's like in your car. If you press the accelerator, um, you, know, you, you might go faster or slower. The car doesn't care whether you go faster or slower. It doesn't care what the speed of the car is. It's only caring that you're increasing the throttle and decreasing the throttle. Um, when you hit the cruise control, then all of a sudden the car starts to care about that output of your system. So if you think of the system as kind of sometimes you call it called a plant, it's whatever, whatever's actually doing the stuff um, in a, in a accelerator, for instance, 
my system is the, the, the accelerator, the throttle body, the engine, the wheels, the road, all of that. And out of that comes some system output, in that case, speed. So I've got some sensor that figures out how fast the car is going. It takes that output and I am able to set a reference. Say, I want to go 78 miles an hour. The measured output from the sensor comes back and the, the whatever control system details that says, hey, I'm going to 75 miles an hour. Okay, well, I've got a three mile an hour measured error. Hands out to the controller. Controller changes whatever it has to do. And this is where the complexity really comes in. Whatever it has to do to change that, to actuate the system to get that desired result, uh, it's able to do. So it says, hey, you know, we need to push more on the accelerator or, hey, I'm already going, I'm already getting there. I'm accelerating. I don't need to push any more on the accelerator, um, whatever that's necessary. So that that makes that closed loop control. Um, uh, and in our case, we can do the same thing. So we can take the, uh, we can take the, um, you know, that same, that same uh, control loop, which actually, you know, is, is everywhere. So your thermostat at home, your oven, uh, your car, drones, airplanes, whatever. There's tons and tons of these different control loops. We can do the same thing here. So from the, from the sensor, we've got, we're able to measure that sensor. We'll take that ball position, hand it to a controller along with whatever point I want that ball to go. Out of that controller will come, hey, this is the beam angle, the angle you need to set the beam at, and we'll push that through. So we've been able to close that loop. Um, and so we'll, we'll do that with that controller. Uh, now the, the uh, most common type of control you'll see, or, or maybe most, most prolific, uh, is called a PID controller. Um, and in fact, if you get a lot of um, different, you know, I think of ovens for, uh, oh, actually I've got a, a, a grill that has a temperature control on it. And in that grill, I can go in and change the value of the PID. It's using a PID to do that loop. Um, and that's just a combination of these three, these three sensor types. Uh, and I've got a, uh, through some of the work we've done, we've got a package out there to actually implement this, this PID uh, or PID loop in uh, Elixir. So let me switch over to this real quick and just show you that controller. Um, so this is just a gen server that's going to control that, have that controller. Got a couple of head things of kind of things we want to do with it. We want to be able to turn it on, turn it off. We set a target where we want the ball to be. We want to be able to change the configuration of that. So change some of the parameters we use, um, get where it is now and then subscribe to it. Um, in that init, we're going to subscribe to the ball. Again, that input, that input uh, from, from to the controller is just the ball position. It's really the only data we're giving it. And uh, We'll subscribe to that. We'll set up the PID. Um, and there's a few things in there that are, you know, some of the, like the, the angle of the arm can go four and a half degrees high, four and a half degrees low. So I tell the PID, you can only, your output is limited, is, is clamped at 4.5, negative 4.5. Um, a few other things that, um, that are more around this specific problem. Um, and then really the, the key becomes here. So where the, uh, uh, where we get the, the distance from the sensor, we immediately hand that, we call the PID and step it through one iteration of the PID loop. So we say, here's your, here's your current state. Here's the new, here's the target where I want you to reach. Here's your current measurement. So your set point, your measurement. And out of that comes a new state to the PID. And inside that is the output from the PID for that loop. Um, the one that I keep in mind here is because the beam, uh, a higher, let's see if I can show you here, um, a higher, Output actually decreases the distance versus a lower input actually increases the distance. So we that's why there's one term here. We do have to flip that output and change the PID output to fit the, the problem space. Um, then we take that PID, we remember the new, the new state of the PID, and uh, we publish it so we can see everything online. Um, so that's the control module. And now let me show you the implementation here. So right now it's all, it's disabled. We can turn it on. Oh, I should zero these out. So we can start with nothing on these parameters. Um, so the, the, all, everything is zero. The output's not, you know, the, the controller isn't actually controlling anything. Um, and I have the ability to change the set point here. So that little green triangle just represents where that, that set point is. Um, and then if we want to tune it, actually build it out, remember we're building three different types of, of uh, controllers. So the first part of that PID is proportional. So this is purely based on the error, some number times the error. So as it gets farther away, it's going to tilt it more. 
Um, and in fact, if I, if I go back to that, um, you can see, sure enough, let me put this to 0.2. And let me put a set point to 50, I'll make it easier. And so as I take the ball and move it out, the further I get away from that set point, the more it tilts. And as soon as I get it back in, it tilts back down. So this is just this very, very simple proportional. I want the car to go faster, I press harder on the accelerator um, without any sort of look at it like that. If I, if I get it to the middle here, and we'll pull up, we'll pull up the uh, dashboard as well. And go to the PID controller, and we can actually see the error that the PID is seeing. So if I leave it, if I put it here and I just pull this off just a little bit without getting my finger in the way, and let it go with 0.2, you'll start to see it's going to go back and forth. And we can actually watch that in live dash view, uh, live dashboard. And actually what we're seeing is exactly what I expect to see if we had too high of gains. We're getting an increasing oscillation. So as we're going further, as the ball continues to move, it's getting worse and worse and worse. So we've got too much gain in the P. Um, eventually you'll start hitting the, start hitting the ends of the, uh, of the track there. And so we can decrease that. And I can do something like 0 0.5 and 0 0.05. So cut it, cut it forth. And actually this gets really, really slow. And in fact, a couple of times I've done this, it'll just stop. So we know we're too low on the PID. And again, we can see that here that, hey, it's, it's stopped. It's not in the center. Um, so we can increase that. And let's just double that to, to one. And uh, we can now, if I take it, I kind of perturb it a little bit here. Perturb it a little bit less here so you can see it before it hits the end stops here. If I perturb a little bit, you'll start to see that back and forth. Um, and you'll notice it's not going to expand. It's not really going to contract. It's going to kind of keep this constant oscillation, which is just a decent place to start when you're tuning it, to tune that p-value to get that, that kind of consistent oscillation. Um, but you'll notice it's actually not centered on zero error. So even if it was to bot to flatten out, the ball would still end up somewhere, somewhere over here. Um, and that's probably because the, the sensor is not exactly right or the, the, the desk is not perfectly level. Um, but that's where we use something like the, the inter integral value. So if we look at the, the integral. So the next step is the integral value. So basically it's the integral of the error. So in other words, the, the, the area under the curve of the error, or if you're in the error for longer, it's going to slowly increase that output of the system of the, of the controller. And we can actually see that. Um, if I take this, let's get rid of the, the P value. Let's add in, uh, let's do point 0.2 here. And if you watch, if I hold the ball back here, you'll notice it slowly increases until it can't anymore. If it's in the middle, actually, let me reset this real quick. So in the middle, it's not changing its output. As soon as I move it away, the longer of time it's just there, it'll start to increase the, the height or the, the, the angle. You go back the other way, same thing. It'll increase, it'll increase that angle over time. Um, and the integral control by itself is, is going to be terrible. It's going to constantly go back and forth nonstop as it's, as it's basically paying back whatever the, uh, the accumulated error was from the previous time. Uh, so that'll slowly just keep going over and over. Um, so that's the integral part. It helps us get rid of that, uh, that steady state error. And then the last one is the derivative. A derivative basically tries to keep the ball still. So it's a damping action. Um, it is the error, the change in error. So as the error is getting smaller, typically if the error is getting smaller, it's going to try to decrease your output. Um, and it, it works actually works really well to see it uh, more so maybe than, than uh, watch. So if I go back here, let me zero out the KI value here. And let's give a KD value of something like six. So it's going to constantly fight the motion of the ball. So the ball's sitting still, it's actually a little jittery. That's because uh, of a couple of different things, but it basically is just a little noise and a signal. But if I try to move it, it's gonna try very hard to keep the ball wherever the ball is, not let the ball move. Um, and so if you combine those in, uh, you get that PID. So you get the, the, the P value, which takes care of trying to get into the air, you get the I value to get rid of that, that steady state offset. And you get the D that 
uh, dampens that output. And so in a typical tuning, this is kind of a typical example you'd see uh, one, um, uh, you know, if, if the goal is to get this thing to from zero to one, the path it might take over time as I increase the P value uh, is going to get there faster. If I increase the integral value, it's going to take rid of that steady state error. And then if I increase the derivative value, it's going to lessen that overshoot and dampen that those oscillations and get it right there. Ours won't look this good when we're done. This is a very nice, uh, very nice tuning here. Um, so in fact, let's go and actually tune this thing now. So now that we have everything here, we can see the error. Uh, let me get rid of that. Let's go back to zero. Um, we can actually tune each piece. So KP, I think we were at, uh, we found one was a good value. And that's a, a good value to start with. If I can get it to kind of do those slow oscillations back and forth as we're watching it, try to get to this green triangle. Um, and that's pretty good. We'll get these back and forth. Uh, I don't know what the ISA state is yet because it hasn't still out. So I'm going to mess with the, the derivative to try to get rid of those oscillations. So I can increase that uh, something like six. And then all of a sudden, as it's trying to get there, you'll see it's actually wants to move. The, 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 uh, the P value wants to get to the middle, but the D value is constantly fighting it. And you can actually see that in the data here. If I look at the P value, it's been trying to get it. You know, It's got a, a signal. It's trying to get the beam to tilt but the D value is constantly fighting it. Every time the P value moves the ball, the D value overrides it and says, no, you, you can't get there. So we can decrease that. If I decrease to four, and then let me actually, let's do this here. Change 20 until to go 20. You can still kind of see that motion. So typically what you do is just keep increasing the P value until eventually you get enough, enough of an effort to get it over to the spot without, the, without that dampening, keeping it from getting there. We go to point four. Let's try that. There we go. We're getting there. Um, in fact, we might just decrease this to point three. And now, if I head to ten, it kind of does what you would do. It tilts the ball, gets the ball rolling towards the spot it wants to, and then at the last minute, right before the ball gets there, the D value takes over and turns the beam the other way to slow down the ball so it stops right at that point. And you can see this error. This is exactly, almost exactly what we want. You've got that really fast uh, rise time. You've got no, almost no overshoot um, from the D value. And if I go to 25, it might even. So it's going to try to do everything it can to keep that ball right there. Now, what you are seeing, which is uh, good, because sometimes it doesn't show up, <laughs> you are getting a steady state error here. So even though we're telling the ball to, to be at 24, we're pretty much always about half a centimeter the wrong way. Uh, and so that's, that's where your KI value comes in. If I do, let's call it 0.2, then you'll see this will slowly decrease as it, the KI value says, well, you've been off for too long, but it's slowly moving you back. And we'll eventually get back to having pretty much close to zero. We're getting there. Um, and this is a lot of fun to do for a while. It's been going behind me for hours at a time today. And then once in a while it gets off, it gets bumped and it does this little, this little dance. So that's really yeah that's that's the the tuning um I was hoping to show was uh the ability to see through to use that uh dashboard use the telemetry data um and I'll be honest we as I said we we've done in vehicles Aaron and I both sat in the back of a of a Ford Escape in 2005 getting nauseous as can be trying to reflash the code they're trying to read excel we used to copy excel documents or copy long list of numbers put them in excel graph them to see these types of charts um, while the car is bouncing around and trying to trying to fix speed stuff. Um, the ability now to get this live right away, um, right in your web browser, or even better when Aaron's out in, uh, in Illinois or New Orleans now, he can uh, wire guard over to our, to our box and see this himself if he wants to. So there's incredible, incredible tooling that's available. Um, and really the best way I can uh, kind of describe it uh, is to say you know, it really is it really is a um, you know kind of having a built-in oscilloscope. Um, and in fact, just to show that one more thing, if I go back to the server, the servo. So the servos, uh, like I said they're smart servos. Um, they're actually uh, you. They're all done over serial. You can tell it what position to go to. You can give it different profiles, all sorts of different stuff. You can also interrogate it for different things. So um, 
right now I have every hundred milliseconds. Uh, we're actually interrogating the servo for its input voltage, the current to the servo, and its actual position. Um, and then I'm submitting that, uh, sending that out as a telemetry event. And then over in the uh, telemetry, again, we're just saying that as just simply summary. And what that means is, and when I come back to here, I've actually got the servo current going to the servo plotted in my application or the voltage of my carrier. I've got a decent power supply, so it's not two problems. Uh, or the actual position. Um, so I can tell the error. If I'm telling the servo to be here, it's actually telling me I can know this actual position. If I can take the current. If actually, let me turn this back to uh, disable that here. And I can watch the current. And if I come and press on the servo arm, I can actually see the current increase as it's trying, as the servo itself is trying to maintain that position. So like I said, it's like having a, an oscilloscope, not only to this level stuff, but all the way across your, uh, your application, your product, um, whatever level you want, you can end up showing it here, um, send it off to whatever. Uh, we've got uh, Grafana serving a lot of this stuff as well. So everything I'm able to show here, I can also send off to a logging server. And not only come back and say, hey, you know, the boat did this. Uh, oh, here was the actual current on the servo when it did that. And it's not hooking up a whole other system to do that. So anyway, uh, thank you guys. Uh, hopefully that wasn't, I didn't hit an hour, so I'm happy. Um, <laughs> uh, again, if you have any questions, you can reach me at, at P. Kenny on the Slack or, or uh, pretty much um, uh, pretty much any of the, any of the social services, social uh, sites. And yeah, that's, that's all I have. Awesome. Thank you very much, pal. Um, are you taking questions right now? Yes, absolutely. I'm going to switch my camera back to my more flattering camera. I just hit the button so everyone can um, unmute themselves to ask questions as well. Uh, one of the, the first things is, I guess I should just say thank you very much for creating a PID library. That's been something in the back <laughs> of my mind uh, for a while. So nice to see that you've already done that work. This, this looks incredible. Um, the other thing that I noticed that also looks nice is when you were changing your set point, your library doesn't have a kick to it when you're changing the set point. And I've seen that can happen yes. sometimes in some PID controllers. So um, I don't so know if there's anything actually, you want to, yeah. So that's this setting here, zero D on, on set point change. So basically, and I think I can actually, let me see if I can get into here and show you. Um, so in, the, in a situation where I'm trying to get the D value out, if the set point is not the same as a previous set point, it zeroes out the D for one step. So I don't get that, I don't get the immediate change. I have a low pass filter on the D as well, which is that tau value um, that it doesn't always do it. So for the, especially the big jumps. Um, so I, you can do that as well, but this way I just get absolutely no output um, from the D term until, until it stabilizes. But you can turn it off for times when you wanna, like the, the boat will maintain a speed profile. So my, my set point's always changing, for instance, on the speed. So in that case, I want that D value to always be there. You can turn that off. By the way, there actually is. So one of the problems with calling PID is if you look for anything Erlang Elixir called PID, you won't find it. Um, and literally today I finally found, I was looking at, I mistyped mine and turned up, there is actually another library out there. <laughs> All this time, there's another one called PID controller, uh, not PID control that uh, th was out there. Um, I think it's been, a, it's been a few years since it was maintained. And I take a sense you're using this on vehicles. This is, I, I think I saw it's in 010 right now, but it's good for uh, for using it on real things yes. right now. Okay, awesome. Uh, uh, you know, it's uh, we're, we're, we're in product development. It's all 010. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as is with no warranty. Exactly. <laughs> uh, one question that comes to my mind around the PID loop is uh, how do you counter like sudden acceleration or jerk? So like I've I've ridden in a Tesla that's had this set badly before, where it like suddenly slow down and then slowly sp speed up and suddenly slow down and suddenly speed up. Is that what we were just talking about with that zeroing out of D? Uh, I don't know enough about the. Um, I, the I would imagine that in their case, they're uh, they've probably got that pit, their their low level PID tuned well. It's probably just the higher level stuff. Um, but even so, we have a we have a couple of processes that run on top of our speed plan that say, well, this yeah, the speed plan goes go, says go from zero to forty miles an hour right away. Um, we're going to slow that down and not let it actually command that. 
but you can also do there's, like there's a term. This tau here is is the is low pass filter for the the D term specific, specifically only because the D term is the one that's most the derivative is most susceptible to to any noise that comes through. Um, I have one question. Uh, in the earlier of the presentation, you showed that there is a there is a graph that uh, there is a web camera connects to the nervous and the other like steering uh, connects to the ner nerves. This each nervous box are like nervous devices like separate or just it's one device that connects to all of these sensors. No, it's it's one separate for the most part. We've got a couple that are shared. Um, it just depends on load. Um, but the the beauty is that they they can be they can run the same system. Um, and I've got different, whatever's attached to it. Actually, um, when they deploy, they actually figure out, oh, I'm, I am attached to the joystick. So I'm there for a joystick box and I'm going to run the joystick gen servers, um, and my supervisor. So, so they'll each kind of figure out what they're attached to. Um, and there's a lot of sharing too, uh, depending on what's necessary. So the stuff that's attached to the, uh, the CAN bus, that's reading the, the speed of the boat, for instance, um, we usually put that close to the speed controller just to have everything kind of in one little bucket. I see. Thank you very much. Can you perhaps quickly describe the hardware system you're running all this on? Uh, it's, it's a mix mash. Um, and it's, it's, I'll say it's, it's changing faster than the software's changing sometimes. Um, so we have a, a, a fair amount of embedded hardware. It kind of depends on what's attached to it. Again, we have the, the, the benefit of running, running the network, running the OTP across, um, uh, device independence. So it, it, I can, I can hook up another device that has beam of the same OTP version. Uh, it could be a giant GPU monster box. As long as it's running the same, uh, OTP version, it can still talk to these devices and doesn't really care what the other device is. Um, so we're able to be a lot, really flexible with that. So Paul, have you ever tried training this like with a neural net or something for the uh, rather than using the, the calculus. Yeah. So, yeah. And I should say that the, the PID tuning there's, there's volumes written on different strategies for tuning PIDs, um, some online, some offline, some automated, some manual and manual assisted. Um, we've actually done, so we have a decent simulation of our boat so we can actually run a genetic algorithm, for instance, to try to figure out PID values. Um, I say we've, we've tried in, in a previous life, I've tried, online neural network training for a PID for speed control. Um, and it's extremely nauseating. Uh, it does eventually get better, but it's not, you know, the, 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 uh, maybe the juice isn't worth the squeeze on doing it online. Um, but yeah, there's a, there's a bunch of different, different strategies. Uh, there's actually one that you can, um, which I think I used originally on this was, uh, two names hyphenated. I can't remember. Um, but effectively you, you figure out one value, which is that that oscillate? What what gain gets you that that steady oscillation? You figure out the period of that oscillation, and there's a, a set of math you can do to figure out the optimal I value, KI, KP, KD value out of that as well. Um, so there are some systems that will just do that. They'll do that part themselves, and then use that to to kind of figure out the rest. And so, and, but that's what you're using the rest for is to do those calculations very quickly, or is it? Well, similar? we're primarily using those for anything. Um, uh, so, for instance, interfacing with uh, uh, our radar um, that required a library that we had to have uh, something talk C to, um, and as opposed to wrapping it in NIF, we did um, probably the, we think it's the right thing, which is uh, write a, a, a uh, I guess it was a, a Rustler library around it, um, and have that in a port or have that sending over WebSocket, whatever. Um, mostly we're using the other thing we're using Rust for. I think I may have mentioned uh, we show some lidar stuff. We've got a lot of uh, we've got a lidar that sends us you know two million points a second, whatever it is. Um, those kind of situations, it's a lot a lot more stable or a lot easier to write those in system languages usually. And then we'll do a lot of that math there, kind of distill it down to something semantic and hand that over to the the higher level systems. The uh, the data that you are plotting in Phoenix, are you able to like log that and replay that later? Um, yeah, that's in, in theory. Yeah. So, so we could send that out to, um, you know, a more conventional telemetry system, uh, like a Prometheus or something like that. They could collect it. It probably doesn't collect at a high enough frequency in those cases to log it. In fact, most, most of the logging systems, I think that, that, that would, you would use in that situation just wouldn't have the frequency to get something useful out of it. Um, 
we've we've just done different things for us as we've needed the one-off time we need to actually log it. So we did uh, like some of the system identification for the boat initially that we needed very high high frequency sensor data from a few different sensors. So well, for that, we'll just write out to a flat file and you bring that in elsewhere. Um, but that is one, there's kind of a, at least from that graphs view, there's a little bit of a dead end. Um, it's very useful, but there's a bit of a dead end there until you hook up something else to take those telemetry events. You glossed over a little bit in the presentation when you said it. And how are you doing a firmware update on a boat? <laughs> <laughs> well, just uh, mix, mix firmware and mix upload. So like, like locally, or do you have like a cellular connection or some kind of OTA we, way to do it? Do generally we're on the, I mean, generally we're on the boat doing this testing. Um, we could hook up, um, in fact, we do a lot of, um, uh, cause we're a remote company. We do a fair amount of, of, you know, VPN into the boat run, um, uh, run observer, for instance, join the cluster run observer, do stuff like that. Um, for firmware flash, I think we've, I don't know if we've ever done that. I guess in theory we could. But we've pretty much always done that while we're on the boat. I had a uh, quick question. Do you have a, a faculties for like time step, uh, like for your PID updates, or how do you handle that? Like, you know, every 100 milliseconds or whatever you may do? Um, yeah. So right now, th this one's based on just as soon as I have the data from the sensor. Um, and inside of that, uh, yeah, actually, inside the library, if you look, there's a use system T uh, parameter. So in that case, I'm telling it figure out the time from one step to another and use that in your calculations. So if it so happens, if that T value changes a little bit, it'll account for that. Um, that's not, it may not be the best use. I mean, typically I think you'd want to, even if your time, even if your clock was varying from cycle to cycle, you'd want to maintain a, a single time step for doing those calculations. Um, this is a bit lazy because I just haven't figured out the timing on the the sensor yet. So I just left that in. So I'll have to deal with that. Typically I come back and say, well, look, I'm going to, you know, for instance, on the, on the boat, we do, everything's pretty much in, in hundred Hertz or 10 Hertz. So depending on what loop it's in, it's just, no, this always runs at hundred Hertz. You might get a little earlier, maybe it's running to 101 or 105, but treat as if it's running to hundred Hertz. And that just gives you a lot more stability. Thank you, pal. This was, this was amazing. Great stuff to see. Um, really cool project and also really cool uh, library here as well. So yeah, thanks for uh, mm -hmm. speaking about this tonight.